Okay, great. Well, thank you for letting me come and um, be with you. It is true that I am missing the five-year anniversary, and like my husband likes to remind me. Uh, the thing is, uh, when we started that magazine, uh, we were doing it in very Silicon Valley style, from our living room, from our dining room, from our garage. Um, I was working a full-time job. He was working a full-time job. We were coming home, putting the kids to bed, and then doing a magazine from like 9 p.m. until like 1 a.m. And um, over the course of the five years, um, he has since gotten acquired by a um, by a nonprofit, and that nonprofit now employs him and several others. So he was telling me, like, look how far we've come. You don't even have to be at the five-year anniversary party because you're not needed for all the coordinating. So that was like a very positive way to look at that. I'm going to make this just so that I can see my um, see my little notes as well, my little cheat sheet notes. Uh, let's see. So how many of you all are, just to get an idea, how many of you would consider yourselves to be like in industry? And how many of you would consider yourselves to be like in academia? Okay. And you can report that audially, so for the- Oh, sorry. So that would be zero academia. <laughs> and that would be, I would say like 75, no, maybe like 80% industry. So what would you, the rest of you that didn't raise your hands, what would you say? How would you classify yourselves? Retired. Retired. I want to, I want to be that. <laughs> or it would be nonprofit. Or nonprofit. Or, or what was the other one? Okay, I, I like that. I just like to kind of know where everybody's at. Um, so yeah, so Paul asked me to come here today. I think, how did you find out about the paper that we had written? Was it through Kai or was it just on the internet or through Kai? Okay, so yeah, so I presented at Kai last year on a paper that we had written and sort of have expanded this talk a little bit about a project that we've been working on that's been sort of near and dear to our hearts. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself just a little bit more. Uh, so, oops, that's Yosemite. Mm -hmm. Still Yosemite. All right, so I am the lead research, researcher at UE Group, which is a research and design, uh, UX research and design company in uh, San Jose. We're in the lovely neighborhood of Willow Glen, which is a wonderful place to visit. So if you ever do, you should definitely look for the Garden Theater, which is an old historic um, theater there, and we're on the second and third floor. Um, you're welcome anytime to come say hello, uh, an open invitation, um, lots of great places to, to eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner there in cute little Willow Glen. Um, I myself have been there since 2004. The company has been around since 2001. So uh, I definitely have seen um, a lot of growth in that company since I've been there. Um, I am actually, I don't have a, um, like a HCI background necessarily. I actually started off as a marketing um, major, did some marketing jobs, kind of loved the marketing research part of it, but really loved like the psychology part of it too. So it's a longer story that I'm gonna get into, but I ended up at UE Group and uh, fell into it and sort of found myself thinking, how did I not know that this existed? Um, it was a perfect match for my personality. It was a perfect match for my skill set, And um, I am still so thankful for kind of the random way that that happened uh, in my life. So today I want to take us through a couple of, uh, of different things. I want to talk about the difference between um, user experience, customer experience, and then what I'm calling the emotional experience. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the struggles that we've had as a company, and for me personally, to really uh, measure emotion. Uh, and some of the methods that we've used in the past and methods that we've considered in the past. Um, our journey to really understand how can we start to collect emotional measurements and report those out to our clients and end it hopefully with some time to have some um, discussion. I want to start off by saying I don't consider myself, although we've been really in this space for the last couple years really thinking about this, I don't consider myself the end all expert in emotions by any stretch of the imagination, nor do I consider myself the expert on really anything um, other than my, my kids, which I don't have a picture of um, for you today. But you'll have to trust me, they're adorable. Uh, so. 
as I mentioned, I've been working at UE Group for about um, 12 years, and I've really seen the landscape change in UX a lot. When I first started, we were doing lots of 100-person studies with a lot of ratings and um, a lot of reporting. We were getting three to four weeks to work with whatever we were going to be um, you know, testing. And then we were getting two to three weeks to write a report. And over the last uh, really even maybe six or seven years, that has changed dramatically. I mean, I'm lucky. I got the prototype for the study that I'm going to start tomorrow. I got that um, yesterday afternoon, right? I finished the test plan today. I'm going to write my note sheet, get my note sheet ready tonight. And then we're going to test it for three days. And um, we end the study Friday at 2.30 PM. And and my client would like the majority of the notes by the time he leaves that, that day. So I know that sounds cray, cray cray, as my daughter would say, but, um, and it is, it actually really is, but that's kind of been the type of whirlwind I feel like we've entered into. We do still get some clients that come for those longer, longer engagements and give you a lot more time, and we love those clients. Um, but I guess it's been more the exception to have that than the norm, and now we're really seeing a lot more um, requests for things to be way more agile. The other thing that we've seen change over the years has been the type of ratings that we've been collecting, and all along the way, and when I really started to think back, you know, we were asking for ease of use, and we were asking for satisfaction and likelihood to use, and all of these types of, of ratings. But at the end of the day, what the client was really wanting to know was how did people feel about, about the thing that they were testing, right? How did they feel about it was e whether it was easy or difficult? Did that translate into them feeling good about that experience, or did that translate into them feeling frustrated, which was then negative? Um, so we were asking these rating questions in a way that the bottom line answer, when I would go to the client's office and present the report, essentially was how did people feel about that? We did benchmarks, we've done a lot of benchmarks, and in those benchmarks, you know, you've got two different products, and you know, I was kind of pained by the fact that we would go to present the results again, and then all of a sudden, you have these like really narrow margins between the two different products, and it's like, how do you say that this one's better than that one when they're so close together? Um, increasingly and increasingly, we were getting the same types of requests, which were, which was really, how do people actually feel about my product? How do they feel about their interaction? So I mentioned a few of them. We started to take that request and uh, translate that into, let's try the NPS score. Let's try different Likert scales. Let's try the SUS score. Let's try uh, measuring it by a lot of different, uh, a lot of different methods. Um, but we, f we really started to feel like while those were all really important, we started to feel that there was an opportunity for a z-axis, um, is basically how we've described it, of, of emotion. So to illustrate that, I mentioned kind of thinking about the UX experience being about more than just UX. You know, for a while there, over the last um, maybe eight years or so, everybody was talking about UX and then customer experience. And now I, I think a lot of us are talking about the emotional experience. So this is kind of how I see those three different elements. So as you all know, the user experience is how the user interacts with the product. I'd consider customer experience to be how they interact with that product and that organization over time. And that customer experience, you know, everybody starts, started doing journey mapping and all of those things. But at the end of the day, what people were really trying, what we were really trying to figure out is that emotional experience. How, do, how does that user feel about their interactions over the course of time? All of those aspects really make a complete experience. Um, the study I'm going to do tomorrow is heavily focused on user experience. It's really leaving out the, um, the customer experience and emotional experience part of the equation. Being a consultancy, I don't always get to dictate what I would want to measure in these studies, but this is one where they've definitely isolated UX. And in that regard, you're really missing out on a lot of it because I know what we're going to be what we're going to be testing tomorrow has the opportunity to really gather some interesting insight into how the user feels about that interaction and how that's going to um, translate into whether or not they use this or not. So it's an, I guess my point in saying that is it's an uphill battle trying to convince a lot of my clients that um, looking at emotional experience is, is necessary. On the flip side, I get people coming to us all the time saying, we want to know how people feel. So I feel like I'm running kind of on both uh, sides with that. 
All right, so we all know that we make decisions based on our emotions, and companies know this too. There's positive uh, emotions, and there's the negative emotions that we feel. Did not take me very long to just do a quick perusal of uh, Twitter and Facebook to see um, just regular old people having um, some maybe negative things to say about uh, some of their experiences. I mean, now with, with the ability to have things at our fingertips and be able to immediately say how we're feeling, it can really ruin a brand. And you know, we've seen that happen, right? Where somebody does a commercial about something, people are tweeting about it before the commercial's even over, and the brand is having to play catch up. Um, so there's, there's definitely negative examples, and there's also positive examples. You'll see, there's my example. I mean, I was so enamored with my Chromecast after I got it, I thought it was just like the most amazing thing ever. Um, then I wrote a Facebook post about it. I mean, now thinking about it, that's like kind of lame. But, um, but I mean, I was compelled to say something. It, it moved me in a way that made me want to tell other people about it. So for Google, the fact that I felt that way about their, that Chromecast in that moment, I mean, that's, that's a golden moment for them. I was feeling something, and it was, it was um, compelling me to, to move. And that's why, to me, uh, measuring uh, and helping our clients understand that emotional experience is so important. Oops. You know what? Sorry, I lost my notes here. just wants to mirror. There we go. Mirror's gonna mirror. mirror. There we go. So at the end of the day though, we still have this question of how do we actually know what people are feeling? Um, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit, but before we do, I would like you to turn to your neighbor and ask your neighbor how they're feeling today. <laughs> to break up the conversations. Um, all right, so you guys are probably a little bit more of a friendly crowd, but I'm sure that some of the things that you heard were things like, I'm feeling okay, I'm feeling fine, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling great. If you're like me, you often wonder, like, is that really how people feel? Like, are you really feeling good and great? The other day I asked somebody in the office how they were feeling, and she told me she was feeling good. And then um, I'm pretty good at pressing when I know they're not feeling good. And um, anyway, I got a, the point is I got a lot of juicy stuff out of her <laughs> as a result. But, um, but we all know, right? I mean, they're, you know, you're not really like good friends with someone. You kind of answer the question. You're feeling fine. You're feeling good. Some of that's code word for I don't want to get into anything more, and I'm just going to have this, uh, have this little interaction with you. Um, you may have heard, if people were feeling a little more forthcoming, you may have heard that they were feeling busy, that they were feeling tired. Um, maybe excited about um, their week. I'm gonna hope nobody said this, but um, I know that would be kind of sad. Hopefully you didn't hear that, but that's, that's a very val valid emotion, I'm gonna say. That's, that's definitely, that's fine if you feel that way. Um, so when we wanna know how our users are feeling, it typically isn't much better. I did a study, we did, we did this where we were asking our users how they felt about something, and it was the exact same kinds of comments, right? So this is where it became a problem for us, where you're trying to find out how people are feeling, and common sense and what your kindergarten teacher told you would be ask somebody how they're feeling. You ask them how they're feeling, and they give you these answers, which are you know, not really helpful. It's not really, doesn't really get where you're trying to go. 
And you can't quantify it because everybody might give you the same answer, but it's not really like a good answer. It's kind of basic. Um, or they're giving you a whole bunch of different answers that you can't really quantify. And then for me in my position, have to go back to a client and say, here's how people are feeling. So what do you do? That's, that's kind of where we were at, I would say, about three or four years ago when we were trying to really crack this net. So there's a lot of solutions out there that claim to capture users' emotions. And I really shouldn't even say the word claim because I, I will say that they are definitely, there are definitely purposes for all of the different types of uh, solutions that are out there to capture users' emotions. Um, and we're going to talk about some of them, and we're going to talk about the pros and the cons, and, and some of the study that we did to kind of compare these types of methods to others. Um, in a nutshell, and by nutshell I mean a super, super pistachio nutshell, um, these are some of the um, some of the different methods that are out there. Already, I know I've left I've left some off. These are just sort of to fill up one slide, basically. You've got um, your biometric options, which are in some way right measuring something on the body, in the body, what's happening in the brain, what's happening with like sweat glands um, on the face, things like that. You've got passive data collection. Um, so in this in this case, we're talking like video analysis or voice analysis. And then you've got the more active analysis, which would be um, the user self-reporting or the researcher's observational. Um, it would be like the Paul Ekman style. It would be, um, or it would be just asking the user how they're feeling. So thinking about some of these from a pros and cons perspective. So from a biometric options, I mean, if you trust the technology, you really can't argue with someone's body doing um, what the, someone's body is doing versus what they say they're doing, right? I could ask you, like in that example with my coworker, I asked her how she was feeling. If I had had something strapped up to her, she's telling me good, I'd be able to immediately tell that she wasn't feeling good. Um, you, you, you can't really argue with the fact that there are sometimes things that people do within their body or even within their face that doesn't match what they're, what they're actually saying. They might not even be aware of how they're feeling. Um, the negative, though, is that these really are quite expensive, and they're also quite invasive, um, especially for the type of work that we do. I mean, we're not a, psych a psychology firm. We're a just traditional usability research firm. Um, you know, typically, we're not meant to get at that level of detail, so I'm going to caveat what I'm saying by, by mentioning that the type of studies that we get asked to do typically don't require this, but this is a way that you could use to access um, how people are feeling. In terms of the more passive options, uh, so things like video analysis and voice analysis, um, they're relatively inexpensive, at least especially compared to the biometric options. Um, they're generally invisible to the user, so you may be recording their face or recording their voice, but they don't know that you're doing that, which helps, right? Because you're not starting off the whole experience saying, um, great, my name's Sarah, your name's this, we're going to be talking about a website today, but first, let me place this hat on you, you know? There's, there's, you don't have to get over that, that um, gap when you're dealing with these passive data collections. You know, the negatives of this is that it's potentially not a great indicator of feeling, so people have different levels of expression. Danielle, who's my coworker over here, I brought with me. She is. Uh, she wears her emotions on her face. <laughs> she there's really. It's hard. I mean, maybe you're a liar. I don't know. But the thing is, she <laughs> is like all smile, all not smile, or whatever it might be. Um, there's other people who are not like that, and so I think. Um, the video analysis of, of facial coding, I think sometimes there's there's that type of a problem. Did you have a question? Yeah. Do you mention the video analysis? When we were doing this, when when we talk about the study that we did, no, we didn't let them know. Yeah. Yeah. We're just a we're recording this. Oh, so, so, so we're recording. Oh, I, okay, yeah, 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 I can do that. She asked me if we let the user know that we're recording their facial um, thing. So uh, no, we when we did our study, which I'll talk about in a little bit, we did not let them know that. But we they knew we were recording because we were already recording the session. We just didn't tell them that we were recording the session for the purpose of also doing a, a facial an uh, analytics. Although in our study, we we did actually tell them that we were doing a bunch of research and that that they they signed a thing. Yeah, I mean we the. 
the study that we were doing to do this case study that I'm talking about, they knew that we were going to be using all of that for, um, for like other research that we were going to be doing. Yeah. So these are the, um, so these are kind of the more passive uh, data collection. And then more active, meaning that it's going to involve a little bit more from either the user or the researcher, is uh, the idea of self-reporting and the more observational method. So, you know, the positives of this is it's not invasive. Um, but the negative is you can't always rely on users to be clear or to really be able to express how they're feeling. I mean, I think that's true for a lot of us. If you're talking about... Um, even complex feelings that we have, it's hard to put into words how, how you're feeling about something. Um, I was just telling Danielle on the way up that my son, who is 15, just told me the other day, he was like, oh, mom, can you believe I'm going to be going, well, he's almost 16, he's like, can you believe I'm going to be going away to college in two years? And I was telling Danielle, I was like, you cannot understand how complex that feeling is of, I don't even know what that feeling is, right? It's like everything all at one time and tears, you know, all kinds of things happening at one time. So um, they're complex, and sometimes it's hard to get that out, out of someone. But it's also hard for a researcher to observe that as well. So at the end of the day, we, as UE Group, a company, decided that the fancy biometric options were not for us. And so for us, we eliminated those straight away. So again, I'm not here to say that those are not the right way to do it. But for us and what we were doing, and as I mentioned, kind of this path that we were on where we had moved away from these really, I mean, to be frank, expensive, 100-person long-term studies and had moved into a world where it was quick, agile, um, less expensive studies that we were doing for companies, we knew that we couldn't justify um, even spending the time um, with what it was going to entail to analyze the data and um, you know, set up the whole um, session with the user using the biometric options. But there was also another reason why we did not go with biometric options, and that really has to do with the difference between the lab experience. So you can see here that um, this is one of our labs in our San Jose office, and we really pride ourselves on having a pretty, like, you know, cord-free uh, experience there. I mean, the participant can see cameras. They know that they know that we're recording the sessions. Um, there's microphones and things like that. But in general, we try to match the experience of whatever they might be doing. And so to that end, we've had we've turned that room into an operating room. We've turned that room into um, a bathroom for people to be applying their makeup. We've done all kinds of different things. And for us, that comfortable environment space I have noticed the difference. If I go to like a, a lab, just like a rented out lab, and I'm having the same session with somebody there, then when we're doing it in our in our place, and we've got like they're sitting in a couch, they're kicking off their shoes or whatever, there's a different level of conversation that's happening, and the data that I'm getting, the conversations that I'm having are deeper and richer. So for us, we knew that that wasn't going to match the level of um, service that we that we provide for our clients in terms of having the biometric type options. OK, but we still want to know. My clients still want to know what their users are feeling. So we're not going to use biometrics. So then how are we going to do that? Well, we experimented with a lot of different things, and these are just some of them. Um, you know, I don't remember what year that was where everybody was talking about frustration and delight. Everyone was talking about, you know, well, I just want my, my customer to feel delighted. And, well, 2012, okay, there you go. Um, that sounds ex exactly right. Um, and so it was like everybody that was coming us, coming to us was like, I want to know how delighted my customer was. So, you know, we're like trying to find ways of, of kind of making up algorithms that are going to get at this. And, um, and they got us partway there. We, you know, how, to what extent did you feel excited? To what extent did you feel inspired? To what extent did you feel delighted? We put them all together in some like little machine in the back to kind of come up with some algorithm. And it was good. It got us... It got the, the client the answers that they needed. We just didn't necessarily feel all the way comfortable with what we were getting. Um, and the other thing that we did was we experimented with just being observers, doing that, that more um, active researcher role where we were observing. And so that, in, that meant that my research team and I would sit before a study and we would say, OK, if somebody go, like, gives a big gasp, 
that's going to be, we're going to code that as, as frustrated. Okay, if somebody smiles, but they weren't smiling before, then we're going to, we're going to code that as delighted. And we would kind of come up with these, like, here's, or a, as a positive. And we would come up with these things where it was like, okay, there's different, if they say something, if they do something. But then we realized, well, this participant, she's a great participant, but she, like, doesn't smile. But that doesn't mean that she's not enjoying herself, because at the end, she's giving you a rating that's showing pretty well. Well, why does she come out showing that she's only like one tick of positive where this guy came out with seven ticks positive. So we felt kind of uncomfortable with that process as well. Uh, so then we just started asking people. I went back to you know what my mom said. If you don't know how someone's feeling, just ask them. But then we got the, the, the responses of just fine and good. Um, as I mentioned, these are just some examples of some of the types of algorithms or paired uh, words that we use to help people kind of choose how they were feeling. Um, and we tried to kind of help. One of the studies we were on was having to do with like if things were fun. So it was delightful, but it was also fun. And there was a difference between the two, but then they were also the same. Um, so in general, it just felt very overly complicated, I guess is probably the best way to describe it. Um, so what we really needed from all of this was a way to quantify emotions that were coming from our users. We looked to psychology because we thought maybe there are some tools there that we could use, um, and we didn't really find very much there. The UX world didn't have too much um, there in terms of quantifying um, emotions. So for this section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey that we went on to then create that new method, which we now call UX emotions. Um, and uh, it's kind of morphed into, we, it's not like at the beginning of all this we were planning on creating a, a tool, but um, as a result of doing this, we, um, we thought, well, this is kind of cool, and maybe we could let other people use this too. Uh, so we started to consider the idea of self-reporting, but in a more guided way. So we looked at different... Um, kind of prompts, I guess you would say, for self-reporting, because what we had found in the past was people can't be really left to their own words necessarily without a little bit of help. And so we gave people, or so we started to look at what are some things that are out there from a psychological perspective that might be useful. So we really liked and were most drawn toward um, Pluchik's Wheel of Emotions, but the terms that were being used here just weren't all appropriate for UX. And um, you know, we do a lot of different types of research, uh, but the majority being more kind of consumer-based type things. So um, it just felt like some of those words that were there, I mean, I don't, maybe you do feel rage when you're trying to set up your you know, router or something. That, that could be true. I guess that's, everyone always has like, saves those real deep um, emotions for routers for some reason. Um, but you know, there were, it just didn't, it just didn't feel like these were necessarily the, the right words. Um, so, but we liked the idea of having um, intensity of emotion because we understood that just like you see in, right, if you're doing a Likert scale and you're asking people how easy or difficult was this, somebody might say, okay, well, I'd give it a five, you know, um, and then they said, but it wasn't, I mean, it was a five, but I mean, it was, still was easier than the last thing. And, you know, they're, they're still kind of talking about intensity. And so we knew that we didn't want to just give people the ability to just pick a word. We wanted to give them the ability to pick a word and be able to pick some level of intensity. So being the research kind of nerds that we are, we went back through a bunch of our um, when, when we were being asked by companies to do, to kind of come up with how people were feeling, we went back to some of those um, note sheets that we had, and we came up with what are some of the, the most frequently s described emotions that our participants were saying. And so in this picture here, you can see that it's talking about, you know, we've got words that people were using in terms of, you know, they were interested, they were feeling content, they were feeling, or they were feeling fine, content, ambivalent, they were feeling um, frustrated, you know, disgusted, whatever the words might be. We kind of put all of those up there and tried to determine, okay, well, what's more positive and what's more negative? And then how, what's kind of, where did the intensity fall? So at that point, we um, came up with this, this idea of, we sort of settled on some specific words, and this is kind of like the earliest version of um, an idea that we sort of had was, okay, well, what if there was a way to kind of plot these general emotion words on a positive to negative, and then allow people to kind of select an intensity? So the very first study that we used our paper prototype for we, was an UB uh, benchmark study. 
And this one, what we did, because it, I mean, it wasn't digital or anything, it was just a paper prototype, we just cut up little uh, post-it notes and we had separated the whole experience of setting up, it was a set-top box, so setting that up into these like distinct parts. And so in that study, we were also doing a time on task and we were doing some other things that we were recording. So we would have them kind of complete a section. We would pause after they would, let's say, like unpackage the box. We would pause and then we would talk a little bit about, okay, well, what was that experience like? How did you feel? And we'd have them mark on here how they were feeling. We then had them um, give us some kind of a rating scale about how easy or difficult it was or if it matched their expectations. So we sort of had this like, you know, intermission to talk about how, uh, where they were at in the process. Um, they would then um, put down their responses and um, we'd continue out the whole uh, study that way. So that very first um, study that we did, this was the, um, the output from that. Um, it wasn't automated, so we had to eyeball everything. And because, you know, we thought this was a great idea, but then we got all this data, right, with like these clusters of things, and now we had, you know, there was no way to really do it, so we had to eyeball it. Um, so we eyeballed um, the, basically like the responses and the averages. But what was really interesting about this study, and I mentioned this earlier, that when we were doing benchmarks with two different products, a lot of times the traditional ratings that we were using were coming out almost dead even. And so you can see that in this example here, you can see that the um, ease of use scores um, and the ex expected time, so in this case it was like did the time that it took them to do that match their expectations, we're almost like dead even. Um, and in a way, it doesn't really tell too much of a compelling story. But when you start to, com to combine that, and this is where I talked about that z-axis, when you start to combine that with this idea of how they're feeling during the midst of it, it starts to tell a little bit more of an interesting story. Um, and you know, I mean, here, people really struggled with configuring the network. Surprise, surprise. Uh, people really struggled with that part. But if you looked at the ease of use, they, you know, by the time you finish it, and then now you're gonna talk about it, you start thinking to yourself like, ah, it wasn't that bad, it was, it was fine. But the feelings, and then there's a sense too of right, not wanting to be like, um, not wanting to be wrong or not wanting to you know, be beaten by the network. I'm gonna solve this. Um, and so, but, but when you start talking about feelings, it kind of opened up this different, a different way of talking about things in terms of saying, yeah, you know what? I was feeling pretty frustrated when I was doing that. Yeah, I thought, I mean, it was easy, but I was frustrated. And, um, and this is where we started to feel like, I think we might be onto something here, but we gotta figure out a better way to not have to eyeball, eyeball this. So our second iteration, we actually added um, in some more, um, some more emotions um, because we wanted to put it onto a scale. The quickest and most efficient way for us to do this was we assigned numerical values across a negative four to a positive four scale and then added in a neutral or an indifferent category because sometimes you don't feel anything and we wanted to honor that. Um, and this time when we did the study, if, well, I'll go back a couple of slides, you'll see here, people were doing this thing where they were kind of like putting it in between two uh, emotions or in between two intensities. So this time when we did the study, we instructed them to just put it into one square. And that enabled us to do a, a better quantification. This wasn't our second study. This is maybe like the fourth or fifth time that we had used, had used this. But, and this was actually a diary study that we did. So we sent people over the course of the six weeks that they were interacting with this tool or with this product, we sent them a single um, rating question or emotional rating question for them to answer in conjunction with typical kind of usability questions as well. So the story that's kind of interesting here and really helped us, so this was a study that we did with um, an older demographic. And it was, it was a product for grandparents to talk to their grandchildren. I mean, it's basically Skype, but it wasn't Skype. Um, and so they got, a, they got a free trial, and the free trial lasted, as most free trials do, for four weeks. And then it would turn, hopefully, they'd convert into paying customers. 
So the grandparents, bless their sweet little hearts, they were answering all of these things like, oh, this is a great tool and this is wonderful because they really believed in the idea of it, right? They believed in the idea of it. They were having some problems in terms of getting set up, but they were blaming it on themselves and their lack of technology. And so the ratings that we were getting did not tell as compelling of a story as when you finally put in front of them this idea to be able to tell us how you're feeling about it. And suddenly this idea of not being able because they were having so many technical problems, not being able to talk to their grandkids, that was a different kind of a feeling for them. And so the interesting thing here in this study was that we had um, only a few be able to actually connect, figure out how to actually use it and connect by the time their fourth week was up. And um, so it didn't yield very many people wanting to get to continue on with their with a paid subscription. Most of the people, it took them up until about um, week four to even be able to use it for the first time. And so this really solved a problem or an answer to the question for the client that we had, which was wanting to know, um, I mean, this really helped them understand, oh my gosh, people are feeling like they're lowest about this right before we're about to offer them uh, to buy this. <laughs> And I think this was one of those like aha moments where it just felt like crystal clear and we could have never have explained that to them, I don't think, with um, just saying, well, people seem to be saying this. This just became a really clear way to, to, to describe that to them. And so the action plan for them was we have to give people a longer, a longer uh, free trial time. So... We decided to go ahead and um, digitize this, and so we created, we used, our, so we're a design and research company, and so we decided to put some of our resources toward actually designing this, if for no one else, just ourselves, um, because we were using it, and that's where, um, that's where this tool uh, came from. But we still had a lot of questions because we are researchers, and uh, I guess the questions really were, you know, is this, is this self-reporting method really, um, an effective method, or should we be using other um, methods as well or instead of? Um, and specifically because at the time, about two years ago, uh, the facial analytics and the verbal analytics were really kind of coming out like gangbusters. So we really wanted to understand, like, maybe we should put our resources behind um, using that in addition or instead of, um, of our tool that we were using. So first of all, the, so we decided to do a study. This is what became the CHI uh, paper that we did. Um, the first thing we wanted to know was, are less categories or more categories better? So we had you know, made a decision from the Pluchik wheel to, um, we thought that was too many, and so we made some decisions about those uh, descriptor words to use. But um, then we started second guessing of like, well, maybe we didn't give people enough words to use. So. We did a study, we ran a UBI benchmark study with 10 participants and we asked them to use two different methods to express their emotion. So we didn't tell them we were doing a study on emotion, we told them we were, I mean we just were doing an UBI benchmark study with them, but we were using um, these tools. So we asked people to, um, to use these different methods and what we found was that people don't always feel one emotion. We saw this again happening where people were putting things in between two areas and yet our tool only allowed you to put it into one space. So this became like a common theme that people don't always feel one emotion. Um, the, uh, it, we also found that it's hard to find words to describe exactly how you're feeling. So despite having the words there in front of you, it, sometimes it was difficult for people to pick a word that described how they were uh, feeling. So in some cases, having more words made it easier because there was more to choose from. But in other cases, it was almost like it was like too much of a cognitive load to look at all of those words and, um, and choose from some. And so sometimes no words were better. So what we ended up doing was coming up with this way of having a slider that just totally took away all of the words so that for the cases where some people the words were really a stumbling block, we wanted them to be able to kind of more interact with a more um, esoteric approach in terms of just a more positive negative kind of emotions um, in general. And it's still tracked in the back end to a score. The second part of the study was uh, who, what I call who knows your user best. And so we wanted to know, like, are those self-reporting emotions that we were using with our tool more or less effective than the other emotion capturing methods? 
So what we did here was, this is where we used, we recorded the session, we had our participants, so we have, a, we have like two cameras, well we have a lot of cameras in the lab, but what we did was we used our lab, we recorded them from the lab computer, and we recorded them from a camera straight on, on the computer, um, because for the facial analytics, for op, like an optimal recording, they want it to be like straight onto their face. So we made sure that we were, um, we were doing that. All their lab cameras pretty, pretty good as well, but we wanted to make sure we covered both bases. So we recorded them from both of those cameras. And what we did was we showed people, because you know, having them set up like a Roku or whatever doesn't always elicit, you can't guarantee it's gonna elicit um, feelings. So we showed them, uh, everybody I think looked at five different um, video stimulus and um, it's kind of ironic now looking back because we actually showed a Trump video and it's just so funny thinking about that because I just, okay, this is parenthetical, but it's just was funny because you're like, surely, like, this is just a face. Um, so anyway, there, it just was kind of funny that that was a video that we decided to show. But we showed several different videos. Some were funny, some were heartstring, some were um, political or whatever. We had those different um, uh, videos that they watched and the whole point was we wanted their face to, to respond, basically. Then what we did was uh, the moderator, oops, excuse me, the moderator observed the emotion and um, we asked people after they watched the video, we straight out said, how did that video make you feel? What, how did you feel? We recorded what they said, we recorded what we thought they were emoting based on what we saw. And then we had them record their emotion on um, our UX emotions chart. After that study was done, what we did was we then put those videos and the audio recordings, we sent those off to be analyzed. So this is where it gets a little bit juicy and kind of fun. Um, we submitted those videos to, um, at the time it was called Emotion, which I believe, I think Apple has purchased them, and so they don't, they're not in existence anymore. And Moody's is an emotion analytics that is supposed to um, pick up how you're feeling uh, based on the tone of your voice. So this was really interesting. Remember I mentioned we recorded people from two different cameras, and so we actually sent in both of those videos, and you know we had it all timestamped so we knew that it was like the same moment. So it was really interesting because the, um, the videos that we got back would be the exact same moment, but then depending on what camera you had used, you would have two different emotions there. So, you know, and then what got really juicy was that um, there was what the two different emotions would, or the two different camera angles would say, but then um, it was very different than what their self-reported emotions were. And so um, sometimes it matched, but um, for the most part, um, it didn't. So this is just an example here of where we have, you can see here the, the um, chart here talks about the lab camera. So the emotion facial analysis said that the person was had disgust and was neutral. The computer camera said that they were surprised, neutral, and sad. The voice said that they were hostile. Their self-report said they were interested, and then their self-report in terms of like selecting out on the UX emotions was that they were delighted. Okay, now we were way more confused because now there was like a lot of different things here. So what we decided we needed to do at this point was we needed to bring people back. And what we wanted them to do now was, and we brought them back about a week after we had done the first um, study. And uh, we brought them back, and what we did was we presented them with a list that just had the, the words, the emotion words on it. We had them rewatch the video that they watched, so it was very, um, is that Matrix or Inception, where they're like in the video watching the video? So whatever, that's what they were doing. They were watching a video of themselves watching a video. And then we showed them this list of words. We didn't tell them where all these words came from. We didn't remind them what they had done. And we just said, which of, you know, rank which of these words is most accurate to how you, um, you were feeling at that time. Um, and so, uh, so then what we did was we, we took all of that, that data and we did a little bit of a comparison. So at the end of the day, in terms of what the participants felt of accuracy, the voice analytics and the video analytics were at the bottom. Their own verbatim self-report, so out of the horse's mouth, their own words, um, as should be no surprise, was um, they felt was very, you know, pr 
pretty close, pretty accurate to how they were feeling. And then the UX emotion self-report came in um, a close second. So I think for us, we just wanted to kind of be able to see, like, is asking people, asking people works for maybe, let's say, 50% of our participants straight up without having to um, give them any word prompts. But then for the other 50%, they can use a little bit of words. They can use a little bit of help. Even if we were to ask everybody and they were to be able to tell us how they were feeling, we weren't able to really like quantify those results, like bucket them. So the tool itself, the UX Emotions tool, allowed us to bucket that. So we were really excited because we felt like, even though there's still a lot more to learn, we felt like being able to give people a tool that would allow them to self-report was getting us closer to how people were actually feeling than some of the tools that were out at the time um, were doing. And that's how we ended up coming up with, um, with this particular tool. Um, there still was a lot left to learn. And um, actually, right now, we're in the middle of uh, finishing up some research and doing a Kai paper, or hopefully doing a Kai paper, on kind of some other things that were left. Because probably even some of the questions that you're going to have, we still are having. Um, so I've mentioned several times that people wanted to be able to choose like multiple words, or they wanted to kind of like straggle between two different intensities and things like that. Currently, the tool doesn't allow you to do that. So we're working right now on being able to allow people to choose two different emotions. The example that I always give is like you get your new, you know, Apple Watch and you're super excited about it, but if there's any kind of pairing or setup or whatever, you're frustrated. You can have two emotions at the same time. That doesn't make one better or worse than the other. It's complicated, right? We're complicated people. So right now we're working on how do you allow people to choose two emotions at the same time and how do they attribute maybe a percentage value to one over the other. Uh, we also wanted to look at some different ways of visualizing the chart. Currently, it's pretty basic, and so we want to see like what's that spread. If you have 30 participants, what's the spread? Where do they kind of fall? Where are they clustered? Um, and then, um, oh, and then also visualizing the, the chart itself. So in terms of one of the things that we did was we had the chart, but we started really liking the idea of something that was a little more uh, compact and that could be done on like a smartphone or something like that. And so the wheel has actually been the thing that we've been using the most. And then, of course, the idea of not having any words at all where there's just the slider. So the study that we're currently kind of in process of doing, but I'm giving you a, a sneak peek to the results, we're really like, do we have the right words? Are those words arranged in the right order? And then, um, you know, can uh, do people need to have multiple word selections? So for this study, what we did was a card sort to understand um, we had all explained a little bit about, about how we got to 84 words, but we basically, like, we had nine words originally, and we said, well, let's give them a whole bunch more words, and let's see which of those words is um, going to be the most valuable to UX um, emotions. Um, we did a survey to kind of compare um, the words to, um, to these three dimensions of valence that we had found from uh, Bradley and Lang's A New Ratings, which is a study that we've been kind of closely looking at in terms of assigning value to words, to emotional words. Um, and then we've been, we did some user testing to understand a little bit more about how people, um, how people order the, the different words. So originally, like I mentioned, we had the nine words. You've got those original words that we had there that came out of all of the, the user testing and research that we've done. We expanded that to 84 words after doing, we have a researcher on our team. She's a PhD that um, one of the things that she's working on on her side um, or you know, extra time is, um, is reading about a lot of the literature having to do with this and that um, effective norms for the English words or that a new study is one of, the, one of the areas that we've been closely watching. So from the nine words, we expanded it to 84 and we sent that out to, um, to people to do a um, card sort to then determine which of these are most relevant. Uh, and then that got us down to 14. So I'll show you the results of that. So of those 84 words, these ones here were considered to be the least relevant in terms of um, from a UX perspective. Um, so again, thinking about it in terms, like they're not bad emotion words. They're just not emotion words that are going to be used necessarily for the, the reason um, that, that we would be using this. 
Um, and so most of these words seem to be like descriptive of emotional responses to people as opposed to experiences or objects or products or things like that. So I think that kind of matches what we were thinking. In terms of the most relevant, the kind of the top 14 most relevant, uh, most of these words were on track with the original nine words that we had previously chosen. Um, and uh, so what we did was we took the original nine nine words that we had along with the extra ones that were here and that became the 14 words that we utilized for for the the second study that we did so in this case basically we um, what we found here so people we did the card sort we did a survey where they kind of matched we wanted to see if people felt the same if their valence basically matched what the the valence that was being measured by that a new study um, if, it's, if it was the same for those 14 words. And what we found was that the original word choices that we had come up with were relatively supported, although one of the most interesting insights was, you know, remember when we were saying, Paul just reminded me, 2012 was when delighted was like the most popular word. We kept hearing from participants over and over again, they're like, I don't think I've ever used the word delighted in my life. And they're, you know, they're like, I would never, I would never choose that word. I don't like, you know, pe people would say things like, I, even thinking about when I have been delighted, I would never use the word delighted. And so really the, the feeling that people had was, let's replace that with the word happy. That, that felt more like this makes me feel more happy. Yeah. Yeah, so she asked if all the users are people with English as their first language, and yes, that's where we started. That's where we're starting, yeah. Um, and then in terms of words and intensity, I guess kind of selfishly we were hoping that intensity wouldn't really be that important because it's harder, <laughs> um, but it is. So that's kind of the way it is. So people, and again, I mean, it does go down to when we've used this in previous studies, like I've said, people might be continuing to feel excited, but their level of excitement wanes. And so we need to be able to give them the ability to, to show that this time I was really, really excited and this time not so much excited. Um, in a study we just completed, they wanted to use it for to kind of measure people's pain points specifically. And that was really interesting because um, the pain points, of course, were all at the really like, you know, low end of the scale, but um, you could tell, I mean, you'd be talking to someone, they'd be like, yeah, that's that's like my intensity is about here for this, this one, this one, this one. And then you when you hit the nerve of like their main pain point, it was like, okay, I feel the biggest, you know, intent or the most intensity for angry that you could possibly feel this has to get fixed. And it just became a talking point to be able to have a communicate or the communication about. And the ability to select more than one word, like I've already mentioned, um, was, was a huge piece of it too. So there's still a lot to learn. We, um, like, like you mentioned, there's language issues, which we haven't even begun to scratch the surface on. Um, understanding color and the localization of color is, is a huge thing that, again, we haven't scratched the surface on. How do you allow for the selection of multiple emotions? We have some ideas. Um, the having a more robust algorithm, hopefully tracking it when you've got two different emotions and two different maybe intensities having to do with those emotions and all of that. Uh, we're working on what that um, algorithm might be. Uh, reporting those visualizations and honestly, even after tonight, my list will continue to grow because you talk to people and then you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't think about that before. Uh, so we still got a lot to learn. Um, you guys can tell me how you feel right now if you go to that little bit.ly link and you should be able to find a little wheel that looks just like this asking you how do you feel about capturing emotions in UX and you can kind of see how how it works um, but this is basically um, kind of where we're at now um, I do feel it has been a little bit of an emotional journey but it's been one that I've, I'm personally kind of proud of because I feel like you know, I, at dinner I was mentioning that UE Group's been around for a long time. I've described us as being sort of like heads down, doing really good work. Um, but in the last couple of years, I feel like we've sort of kind of come up for breath a little bit and have taken a look around and have thought, you know, we've been working on some really great stuff. We've got some really great people who are here. Um, let's, let's start to do something with this. Let's start to do something with um, what we've learned, uh, the resources that we have, and to help others. And, um, and, that's, and this UX Emotions is like the first in a little suite of tools that we're working on um, to do that. 
So that is all that I have, but I understand um, now it's uh, questions and such. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you so much. I would say I am extremely satisfied, excited, delighted. <laughs> and, and you can only pick one right now. I so know. You want to have more than one emotion. And I have two questions. Yeah. Um, one, is this tool available for public? Oh, yeah. I should have told you that. It's, it's in beta right now, and it's totally free. So you can go on to UX Emotion, sign up for an account. The, the worst that you're going to get is um, Danielle and I will email you every once in a while and say, do you have any feedback? Do you want to give us feedback? And we, we want it. So yeah, try it and use it. Great. Um, and the second is um, along the line of language, a co close cousin is culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I was interested if you have explored that um, I don't know, obstacle um, in getting at the fact, one, that um, emotions are expressed, felt, articulated differently cross-culturally, even within the English language. Yep. Um, and two, um, that actually there's a lot of research out there on rating scales and the way that culture influences the way that people rate. Mm -hmm. um, in some cultures, nothing's ever perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so how you factor that into what you're looking at. Yeah, those are good questions. Um, so the for the, in terms of the other languages and other cultures and things like that, we or tip of the iceberg on that. We haven't done much research in, in all of that, but some of the stuff that we have done is talk to some of the partners and people, colleagues that we have who um, are from other countries, and we've talked a little bit about this. And one of the comments that we had was that, um, you know, it's interesting, so it's like for one culture, having words and being able to talk about emotions in a very kind of sanitized way is actually a really positive thing because they, if I was, was to say, how does this make you feel? It's just like, no, there's no way we can't have this conversation. But to be able to put it in terms of it being something that you can select was actually is actually seen as being really a positive type of a thing. It's kind of like a way of neutralizing that conversation that would, that would be a little bit more difficult. Um, and perhaps it's a culture that's more stoic, right? And so this gives a chance to actually maybe um, deal with that, given that the words were the correct kind of words and things like that. And that's something on the back end that we're like, okay, well, if we can track certain words to um, certain, like a scale, basically like a valence score, then um, if we can figure out what that is for other countries or other languages or what those words are, it doesn't matter what those words are as long as they're tracked to the same type of a valence score. So that, that's kind of the direction that we're moving with that. Um, was that, did that answer your question? Yeah. I was, I was expecting <coughs> the conclusion to be, we finally wound up at good, bad, strong, weak. Oh, for the, like, as the selector, basically? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you head in that direction? Did it seem productive? Did that not work? No, that's a good question. I think the, um, we have thought about that. We've thought about just sort of like, well, shoot, let's just throw away all these, like, you know, words and things like that. I think, um, I think having take giving people the chance to take away, like for instance, when I showed that that slider that just does positive and negative, right now in the journey that we're on, we're not 100% comfortable with that because it doesn't really allow for intensity, really, right? And so I think that's something that we've talked about is like I think for some people they really want to have the words to be able to track it to those, or maybe the client wants to be able to say, people felt, you know, 80% of the people felt. Um, excited about this or want to have like a descriptor word associated with it. But when it comes to that slider where there are no words, I think there's definitely an opportunity to have something that's more multidimensional that allows kind of a more simplistic way of dealing with it. Um, this study was more kind of thinking about trying to get the words right first. But yeah, I, I agree that I think it's not simple, and I think that being able to build on it and give a lot of options for us researchers is, is the way that we want to do this. Yeah. Did you do any exploration with using emoticons instead of terminology? Yeah, that's a good question. We That's something that we were thinking about. Um, it was on the table of something to, to think about. And um, 
that felt more tricky in a way because we started thinking, well, maybe emoticons are going to be a good way to kind of bridge some of that cultural or language issues, but not really because then you're in a whole nother, it's a whole nother situation. Um, and then I think the problem that we've thought about faces, right? There's, there's research out there that has different faces. Um, I think where we were, the emoticon one, we actually do use with kids. It doesn't, it doesn't track specifically to this, but we'll use it, um, emojis with when we do kids research, and that's more of just a way to help them kind of explain how they're feeling. So I think there's an opportunity to bubble that up into the tool. Um, my personal feeling is that, um, you know, I think the emoticons are a little bit juvenile, and so I think that it works with the kids. Um, so yeah, that's why that wasn't sort of like the focus at this point. But I think there's I think there's potential there. The poop emoji, for instance, is like speaks for itself. Hey. <laughs> so I have two questions. Yeah. Um, so one, first question is um, I when you're f frame you know phrasing these words like when you're selecting these words that you show to the user. Mm -hmm. Are you fundamentally assuming that whatever words you're showing there is part of their everyday vocabulary? Like vocabulary. Well, and that was the reason for that second study that we did was we wanted to make sure, I mean, when those words first came out of actual words that people had said, with the exception of delighted and frustrated, because when we built it, we were trying to like make that. But um, so they, they were words that we had already heard our participants saying, so we felt pretty comfortable with that, and that's why we did that second study was to see if they were still going to be choosing those words. Um, are they a part of your vocabulary? I mean, I don't know if I walk around saying like, this coffee is satisfactory, you know? I don't, that's not necessarily it, but if I, if we just let good or this great, I, you start to lose some of the dimensions there. Um, so I think we feel good enough about those words that it's part of um, kind of a regular vocabulary. Like, for instance, one of the words that we did in the card sorting was ebullient. I still don't know what ebullient means. Ebullient. See? I don't even know how to say it. What does it mean? Yeah. Really excited. Okay. I, I've never felt that way. <laughs> okay, there you go. Maybe I'll use it now. I like it. I kinda, yeah, I like it. It's a nice word. Yeah, that's a nice word. Probably. Two things. One is yeah. you used a term I don't know a couple of times. I think you said UB benchmark. Oh, UB benchmark. Ubi out, of, bench. out of box experience. Uh oh. Okay. Yeah, sorry right. about that. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And the other thing is um, in your tool, is there a way for a person to change their mind? Or another way of saying it is to get honest with themselves. Mm -hmm. Because you want to report one thing, but when you really begin yeah. to get into it, you realize, well, I really feel something a little different yeah. than what I initially reported. Yep, there is. We In that little hamburger icon there, when you, um, so we wanted to keep it hidden-ish in a way because we wanted, in my experience, when we first started doing this and we let, we were having people put the post-it notes on the paper, for instance, they were able to see like where they came from. And that's positive or negative. I, you know, I think it kind of depends on the study that you're doing. In a way, it was nice to let people see like, oh, I had answered this. And then that, that made them say like, you know what? I thought, I thought that was bad. No, this is, this is bad. You know, it helped them kind of have that kind of conversation. So I, what we did was we hid the option that you could, it's not hidden, hidden, but it's just not obvious that, that the participant could go back and take a look at what they had done and they could, they could change their answer. If the moderator wanted to allow them to do that, if it was like a moderator run study, if it was a, um, like diary study or something where I'm sending out the link, like here I just sent you the link and I, you know, if I had five different moments that you had in there, maybe you wouldn't be able to change it. I'd have a lockdown or something. But yeah, I, I agree that there's times for that. So we have our last two questions. Okay, that was, that was kind of perfect um, because I wanted to ask, uh, in terms of sending out links and stuff, it, it seems like this is a separate, like, Modality, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have this experience, and then I go to this and rate the experience. Yeah. Versus what you were talking about, like in the lab, where you're kind of pausing mm -hmm. and asking them to reflect, sort of in situ. Um, how do you, how do you in the future look to maybe like sort of getting people in the moment, um, but remotely, let's yeah. say. 
Well, so we do something when we do like ethnographies or diary studies, we do like interceptive texts, we call it. And so we, that's why for me as a researcher, it was really important that we figure out how to do links for specific questions um, because I want to be able to text my participants and say, how are you feeling right now? Like I know we did a, a TV study and um, I had already like a, a, a um, interview with them and understood, okay, Saturday nights is movie night at home and those kinds of things. So that was part of my job was to send interceptive texts in the moment that I knew potentially things were going to be happening. And so that gave us a chance to get that, you know, in the moment while it was happening. I mean, that's about the best way that I would imagine that happening, shy of giving someone a link and saying when you feel something or you know I mean that's kind of that's kind of hard so so that's why for me the the links were really really important to be able to to figure that out yeah hi hi <laughs> thanks for the sure. presentation sure uh, one thing that interests me is when you're able to measure two emotions yes. i don't know maybe you'll go to 3 and 4 but it all gets complex after yeah. that right but even two what if there's, <clears throat> excuse me, what if there are chords of like two emotions felt simultaneously that means either the kiss of death or, <laughs> you know, for a product or like wildly successful? So it would be very interesting to see if those kinds of, if like a couple of emotions ring together in some yeah. way. The other thing is I'm very surprised at how inaccurate apparently visual coding is because think about the entire acting and entertaining industry with uh, movies that people track the emotions of lead characters through multiple camera angles the ups and downs the subtleties all of that and somehow like cheer at certain points in a mm -hmm. theater at times. I mean, there, there is a way yeah, that humans sure. track emotions in other people that's certainly serviceable, yeah. maybe not 100% accurate, but you would think that would be much well, better. Well, and I mean, I think where, I, where we were going out with this was an accessible technology that was not too expensive, right, yeah. for, for like our, our lab our practice to use right so like that emotion was a very accessible technology and it claimed that it would and i'm not saying it was necessarily bad because there were times when it was right on you know um but but for the majority of times it, it wasn't right on um and perhaps had we been doing something where people were extremely expressive um because it was something that demanded that maybe it would have been more accurate we tried to keep it um you know, I mean, to be honest, giving them vis or video stimuli of different things was actually more emotional than a typical user study, in a sense, right? So I, d I think that there are there's technology out there that's doing a bang up job on um, facial recognition and all of that. We wanted to go from the perspective of kind of a more agile approach, a more accessible approach, and um, and so. To that end, that was the product that was being marketed as being as being the tool for that. But I do agree that there's uh, there's great technology out there that can probably do a, a way better job than any of these kinds of things. It's just not accessible, and it doesn't work in the lab necessarily. Yeah, no, you you've done your work and checked for accuracy. I mean, if you, mm -hmm. you, the results are pretty clear. My, my, I have a final question, yeah. which is, does the UE group mostly test emotion now, or do they test the whole range functionality and so forth, and you're the go-to person for emotion testing? Yeah, well, all of our researchers have this in their back pocket, and in terms of, like, you know, it's just like any study that we're setting up, and you're asking people, you're asking the client, you know, are you going to be getting gathering the NPS score? Are you going to be gathering the SUS score? You know, would you like to, would you like, we could use this tool? I mean, it's one of the, the tools in our toolbox. Oh, that was another thing. The, I know that there are people who are harder to read their real mm -hmm. emotions. They have like a poker face mm -hmm. or a, even misdirection and stuff. But you wouldn't think that a person would go to the trouble of bringing out a misleading or poker face while doing, you know, putting, taking, no, yeah. putting something together out of a box. It yeah. just doesn't seem like where you'd try to be one up on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> on exactly. Thing. So it seems like it would be all the more accurate. But... Maybe low key. I mean, the emotional range may be small. Yeah. So anyway, I'm yeah. rambling here. So, but thank you again. Sure. Yeah. Let's thank our speaker. Okay. Thanks, you guys. 
Thank you. Thank you.